Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Doug Harkness. I'm here on behalf of the Dufferin Board of Trade. Uh, we want to thank the town of Mullen for the support in organizing tonight's event. The forum is being live streamed by Zoom and the recording will be posted on the DBOT website later this week. So I tell my kids I'm doing things like this and I might be on TV and they don't care and it shows up on YouTube and that's the coolest guy ever. <laughs> we will begin tonight by sharing a land acknowledgement statement. We would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that Dufferin County resides within the traditional territory and ancestral lands of the Tayanantanti, Atawanderan, Haudenosaunee, and Inishanaunee peoples. We also acknowledge that various municipalities within the County of Dufferin reside within the tree lands named under the Haldimand Deed of 1784 and two of the Williams Treaties of 1818. Treaty 18, the Nagasaga Purchase, and Treaty 19, the Ajetans Treaty. These traditional territories upon which we live and learn are steeped in rich Indigenous history and traditions. It is with this statement that we declare to honor and respect the past and present connection of Indigenous peoples with this land, its waterways, and resources. The Dutch Board of Trade is a grassroots, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with a passion for helping local business thrive. One of the key Debot does this is by being a voice of business in Dufferin and advocating on behalf of business needs. Tonight's event allows the public to meet candidates and hear their views on important issues impacting life and work in Dufferin County. Tonight's forum will begin with each candidate's three minute introduction. We will then move into the question period. We will invite members of the audience to the front uh, to stop at the mic and ask their question. Please wait until the moderator, that's me, acknowledges you to begin speaking. Questions should be addressed to all candidates. Candidates will have two minutes to respond to each question. Our candidates can view the countdown timer on the screen in front of the stage. The timer will begin after the question has been asked and will give a 30 second warning and indicate when the time is up. As the forum comes to a close, each candidate will have two minutes to choose to give a closing statement. Candidates do members a few minutes ago to determine tonight's speaking order. We will begin with candidate one and move down the line. For the second question, we will begin with candidate two, et cetera. We will repeat this process. Uh, Robert John Lackey is on Zoom, saying you can't see the uh, timer screen. I'll warn you at 30 seconds and then again at 10. Does that sound good? Yes, that's here. fine. Thank you. Um, I will remind candidates that control of the floor rests with the moderator, and I ask for your respect and cooperation in that regard. Um, we did this in Orangeville last week, and it was great, and I expect much better things in Mono. <laughs> I will introduce our first candidate to give their opening remarks, and that would be Frank Flood. Frank. Uh, good evening and good day to all. Thank you for participating in today's all candidates meeting. I would like to thank uh, the Dufferin Board of Trade and, of course, the town of Mono. Speaking of the town of Mono, uh, for those who are unaware, Mono Center turns 200 years. Somebody's phone me. Uh, 200 years uh, next year. My name is Frank Flood, and I find myself uh, surrounded by some very motivated and talented candidates at this table, in fact, these two tables. October marks 26 years that my family has had the good fortune to experience 10 beautiful acres facing the Niagara Escarpment at the Galamono, our home. Service, integrity, action. These are the three pillars that best describe who I am and what I will do. Budget, everybody's favorite particularly with 10 cents of gas going up tonight. Keep taxes low. I would fully support and encourage more public input into the tax and budget process. Bylaws, are there any that we want? Are there any that we don't want? And are there are those that are in, in place perhaps in surrounding towns such as Malmer, and I'm particularly referring to the additional 
and attached dwelling uh, bylaw that allows you to proceed under that uh, policy. Apparently, it's quite successful. Uh, clubs. Should we review the clubs? The status of those clubs, how much money goes into them, and are we as residents getting true value? Noise and road dust. Wherever I go, everybody's talking about roads. Depending on where you are, the dust may or may not be an issue, but roads, roads, roads. Parking enforcement, obviously with mono cliffs and other types of areas of high, high use. This is increasing and we need to pay attention to it. A speeding and reckless driving. I would highly encourage you to write as our mayor has, as I have, and others have had, write to your MVP. I have not heard from her, but the more letters, the better. Anyway, uh, I'll finish off by saying I would like to uh, and help energize small and medium businesses. We may not need to grow our population much in Mono, but we need to encourage business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. We'll now turn the floor to Mark Darby for his opening remarks. Mark. Thank you. And good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you to the Dr. Board of Trade and to everyone here for making this possible. My name is Mark Darby. I've been a Mono resident and shopping locally now for 31 years and have dedicated many volunteer hours to my community, including gathering garbage from the little allowances on Make Mono Shine Day digging up invasive plants at the Invasive Species Removal Day. But my greatest highlight volunteer today, being selected to serve with some exceptional residents on the original Island Lake Management Committee, where we completed from, from zero our mandate to plan, fundraise and construct our fantastic lakeside trails with Bob's Bridges around Island Lake. I'm an avid year-round outdoors person, bicycle and water sport enthusiast, and environmental advocate. I was a commercial pilot for 47 years, presently retired, and that milestone now gives me the opportunity to devote my full energies, full time, to serving you as a positive, open, and approachable mono counselor. Now without work or any other kind of directions. This is a great place a great place to live, it's a great town, but I understand why Mono residents still have concerns about bylaw enforcement, noise issues, road conditions, high-speed internet access, the impacts and restoration of gravel pits, increased recreational opportunities, traffic safety, protecting natural resources, future growth, and of course, support for our local businesses and farmers. My five-point vision is that together, we can address these issues and make it even better through respect, by protecting residents' rights, by preserving our natural heritage, and by enhancing both communication and our bylaws. Respect and protect. It is important that we respect and protect our residents' rights to peacefully and safely enjoy their property, free from external disruption, while simultaneously prioritizing the protection and preservation of our wildlife, our precious natural heritage treasures, and our critically important life-giving water resources. I feel that it is imperative that all residents have convenient, open-minded communication to your council members in order to be able to easily voice your opinions and concerns through comfortably accessible citizen engagement channels. I would like to see some bylaw review and enhancement efforts that would make it convenient for residents to easily register any bylaw concerns that they have coupled with increased enforcement at specific known priority hotspots. So I thank you everybody for attending and for your attention. I look forward to clarifying anything I've mentioned here and answering any questions. Thank you, Mark. We'll now turn the floor to Doug Thompson for his opening remarks. Thank you and good evening. I'm Doug Thompson and I'm running for councillor in the town of Mono. I've lived and worked in this amazing community for almost 20 years and in Dufferin County for 35 years. 
What I particularly love about living here is the spectacular landscape of rolling hills and the breathtaking views that you can see throughout the town. I also appreciate that the residents of Mo are genuinely invested in the protection of our environment and rural character. I'm running for council to help ensure that all residents of Mono are represented, not just special interest groups. Mono residents deserve to have their voices heard and be represented by leaders who are seasoned in their community as well as sensitive to their issues, whether you live in Cardinal Woods or on the 30th side road like me or anywhere in between. I'm seeking the privilege of public office to be a fresh voice to elevate the community. Mona residents are concerned about maintaining our rural identity while managing the growth that will keep our town vibrant. At the same time, we need to understand how the financial challenges today are impacting so many of our residents. I think the time has come that we can no longer accept continued automatic increases in our property taxes. So many of us simple, simply cannot afford it. I promise to make sure that every dollar of tax money is spent wisely. It's our money. Our taxes are high and council needs to be careful stewards, particularly if we are headed into some tough and rough economic times as I suspect we are. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'd like, now let's turn the floor over to Bradley Mayor Harmon for his opening remarks. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Brad. Um, I figured the best way to uh, introduce myself is to kind of start where I'm at today and where I've come from and then what I think uh, could be a good vision for our community moving forward. So uh, to start, um, uh, I'm currently a real estate agent. I live in Purple Hill. Um, I love my community. I've lived in and around Mono my whole life. Uh, rural living is kind of in my blood because uh, uh, I was born and raised in Cheltenham, Ontario, on the Credit River itself. I remember um, going uh, and hunting for crayfish as a kid. Um, so one of the things that uh, I've been able to accomplish in my life was uh, uh, that will assist in my position as your next counselor would be uh, both my business uh, acumen. I was an uh, honors business student at Brock University. Um, also, I've run other businesses in the past. Uh, in addition to that, I've served um, on a, as a, in a governance role in the past as well. Uh, having just uh, kind of retired from the Ontario Real Estate Association, I've served in uh, many different roles, both nonprofits uh, as well as uh, to assist in my profession. Um, in that role, <laughs> for over 80,000 members across Ontario. So it was very important that uh, I, ha I had a good understanding of the vast different interests involved in uh, good service. In addition to that, uh, governance wise, dealing with the province was something we regularly did. I was actually the chair of the committee that passed the act that governs our industry. Uh, my background as far as, uh, as a kid is, uh, um, you know, I was born and raised by a single mom, four kids. Uh, unfortunately, my dad uh, passed away when I was 10 years old uh, due to mental health issues. And uh, so it was tough, tough growing up. At 12, I was, uh, uh, I started to work at a farm to help contribute uh, to the family and pay rent. Um, and so all in, you can tell through my background that I'm an extremely hard worker, compassionate, determined, and there's really not anything that I think is below what I'm capable of achieving when I set my mind to it. So I'm hopeful that uh, given the opportunity to represent you and this community, uh, that I can show you exactly how um, effective and, uh, and good I will be at representing you and everyone in this room and everyone in this community. So I look forward to the opportunity to answer your questions. Uh, I hope to earn your support and I will be out door knocking and communicating with as many people within our community as possible to make sure I have a well-rounded idea as to what it is our community members want so that I can serve them better. I look forward to talking and taking your questions and thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Brad. Uh, we'll now turn the floor over to Melinda Davies for her opening remarks. Hello. 
I'm Melinda Davey. I'm a retired pediatrician and Ontario physician and surgeon's discipline tribunal adjudicator. For the last year, I'm also one of your town councillors. Um, I'm an empty nester, a avid mountain bike rider, and a dog and chicken owner. I've uh, owned a wonderful wood lot in Mono since 2013 when I became a devoted forest steward. I took my time in the woods maintaining trails and animal habitat and riding my bike. I've lived in Mono full time since only 2018. At that time, I became involved with the community by joining the Mono Recreation Advisory Committee. Um, and uh, as I have a, a bike, I'm a bike club owner and event organizer for the last 13 years, I thought maybe I might have something to contribute. Last October, I was selected by council to fill a vacancy. And since that time, in addition to council, I've sat on the Rosemont Fire Board, the Central Park and Recreation Complex Board of Management, and the 236 First Street Community Advisory Committee, as well as um, continuing on the Recreation Advisory Committee. I've learned so much about the workings of the town of Mono this last year, and I'm really ready to continue to work to be your unbiased kind of voice on council. My intention is to listen to our residents, concerns, and balance those with the best interests of the municipality as a whole, to participate in debate and decision-making in an open-minded and fair fashion. As the world around us changes through the increasing population growth and migration and the crisis that is climate change, with wise decisions now, we can ensure that the town of Morrow continues to be a wonderful place that it is today for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. We'll now turn the floor over to Shona Robbins for her opening remarks. Good evening. My name is Shona Robbins. Before I begin, I would like to recognize anyone who has been personally affected or who has family and friends who have been devastated by the recent hurricanes that ransacked our East Coast and the Southern USA. As you may already know, I've been a Mono resident since 2018. Yes, this may not seem like a lengthy time. However, I did grow up in Orangeville, minus a few years away at school, but my family moved here in 1986. I have been employed under the Mono Recreation Department, a few different part-time positions over the years. My parents, my brother, and his family also reside in Mono. So I have been around the area for quite some time. I have six children. They attend Mono Amaranth Public School and ODSS. My partner and I live with our children in the Camilla subdivision. I have been a post-secondary professor since 2010. I have a BA in English and a professional master's in education. I'm also a small business owner and I enjoy many different sports and recreational opportunities. I have decided to run within this election for a few different reasons. Politics has always been an interest of mine, dating back to the elementary school council days. However, joining this election started for the reason that I saw two different areas that needed some interest in me. The first being an increase in road safety. Backing onto Highway 10, I not only hear, but see the increase in traffic and emergency vehicles that are accessing that road daily. I also have family living off of Highway 9 in Amport Road, and it's absolutely scary to see some of the driving that's occurring on those roads daily. The second reason being the need for some diversity on council. Council has historically been made up of well-educated, very professional residents. And looking at the candidate list this year, this is happening more so in, within this election. However, these members are typically retired. They do live in rural areas. They may say that they do have all residents' best interests in mind, no different than I would claim today as well. But the difference is the actual perspective that one may have when experiencing life in a particular way in Mono. May it be living in the subdivision or having children at home or having to commute on our roadways daily. There is no doubt that one can be open to another's perspective. Nevertheless, it's not the same as living it. Personally, I believe that council should be constructed of a mix of residents. And so in an attempt to connect some of these areas of missing representation, I am here today to run for council. After embarking on this goal of mine, I quickly learned that in each pocket of Mono, residents do have different concerns for a variety of reasons that I have not even discussed yet. 
such as endorsement and support for farms and local businesses, ability to local parks and programs, flexibility and communication. Thank you, thank you, Shauna. I'd now like to introduce Elaine Cates for her introductory remarks. My name is Elaine Cates, and uh, we relocated here in 2005, bringing our girls to Mono to have a rural life where they can learn in and from nature, much the same way my husband and I did. I posted my background, qualifications, and involvement on my website so you can see that I have the skill, knowledge, and experience to do the job. I want to tell you why I'm running. I'm running because I have a passion for Mono and a desire to serve, and this is no fleeting interest. Like you, we chose to live here. We chose Mono for its beautiful skies, its greenness, its night skies, and its small town feel. Choosing where to live is a big decision and a big investment in family, lifestyle, and economic well-being. As counselor, I will, I will be your voice to be at the table to protect that investment we have on to preserve the landscape and to ensure we have responsive um, and um, let me check on this one. <laughs> responsible, accountable <laughs> operations and government officials, staff, and council. I have concerns and I have hopes for Mono. Concerns like keeping out big development solar farms and gravel pits, like keeping people safe in their homes, in our communities and on our roads and keeping Mono affordable. And I have involvement and a history of involvement on all those fronts. I know you have concerns and you have hopes for our town and I really <laughs> wanna hear what those are. And I'd really love to connect with you. So please connect. And I look forward to hearing from you. My cards are on the table. Thank you, Elaine. Next up, we'd like to hear from Ralph Magdalo to give his opening remarks. Ralph, thank you. Uh, I bought property in Mono in uh, 1983. Um, we bought it as a place to uh, escape from Toronto, and that worked well. Um, when I was working in Toronto, I was a surgeon in Toronto, and I was really a very busy academic surgeon in life. Um, I moved up here full time um, 15 years ago. Uh, I first became involved with the uh, rowing club. I was the president and the head coach. Rowing has been a personal passion of mine um, for about 30 years. Um, I'm also interested in other sports, particularly cross country skiing and, and sailing and paddling. In fact, I just came back from a uh, 320 kilometer. Uh, uh, canoe paddling excursion on the Yukon River. What, 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 why, why do I enjoy being a, a counselor? It's primarily because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do good things for this town. We get every two weeks, we get an agenda. There's always new and interesting stuff there, often things that I don't know about. I, said, I have to read it, I have to collect the facts, and then I have to get opinions and then make decisions. I think I'm fairly good at making decisions. I'd say that's one of my strengths. What's going to be the big problem next year, the big challenge? It's going to be all about money. You've heard a bit about the budget. The budget is something that Mono has done an excellent job at for as long as I've been paying attention to it. Um, we, have, we have costs such as policing, which is 20% of our budget. Um, government's almost the same. Roads about 50%, recreation about 10. Many of these costs are fixed, so we can't do anything about them. For example, the uh, Shelburne Fire Department uh, has an increase in capital costs of 23% for next year, and that's passed on to all the municipalities that are involved. So, how are we going to absorb these along with all the other problems that we have with money? There's a 7 or 8% cost of living increase right now. So I think that the biggest challenge that the uh, next council will have is maintaining a budget. 
Uh, some of you mentioned something about high taxes, and you probably know that what your own taxes are. You may not know that Orange Hills is slightly more than twice as much as ours, and Shelburne about twice as much. So we've kept the line on taxes pretty pretty well, I think. So next time, the, next, the people that you're going to vote for, they should have some financial ability. So I sit on the audit and finance committee for the uh, Wellington Doctor and Board of Health, and uh, that's a $23 million budget that we manage. I've been the treasurer of uh, uh, one of the largest um, medical organizations in North America, and I have good financial savvy. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. We now hear opening remarks from Robert John Lackey. Thank you, Doug. I would like to start by giving a thank you to the Dufferin Board of Trade for organizing this meeting and for allowing me to Zoom my introduction and participation in light of a public health concern for me. Uh, thank you for that. And similarly, I would like to thank all those who are in attendance this evening. Uh, for those unfamiliar with me, I'm Robert John Lackey, and I'm running for the position of counselor for the town of Mono. As background, I was born and raised in Orangeville and have resided in the town of Mono for the past 15 years. I attended the University of Guelph, where I graduated with a Bachelor of Science Engineering degree specializing in water resource engineering. I began my professional career with the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, um, and then I returned to Orangeville and worked with a local engineering firm doing municipal engineering. After 21 years, I partnered and managed a planning, engineering, and legal survey consulting firm in Barrie. After 13 years, I retired, but foolishly, I quickly re-entered the workforce working at the town of Orangeville in their infrastructure services department holding the position of manager of transportation and development. I'm confident that my working experience will greatly assist me in making sound and defendable decisions for the town of Mono and its residents. Along the way, I've volunteered my time in a number of areas. <clears throat> I am and have been a member of the Orangeville Lions Club since 1979, acting as their president in 86. I'm a past member of the Soil and Water Conservation Society, being the Ontario chapter's president in the early 2000s and a member of the Bruce Trail Association. This time will also be invaluable in considering issues for the town of Mono. Municipalities face many issues, including aging infrastructure, transportation, climate change, limited financial resources, staff shortages, to name just a few. In dealing with these and a host of others, I am prepared to listen, observe and analyze each concern and only then upon gaining full insight into the matters at hand, will I make a decision, one that I trust will be informed and defendable. In closing, I set my election platform on two key <laughs> plans, experience and communication. I'm approachable and committed to listening to any and all concerns. A full understanding of concerns will ensure the best and most appropriate solutions are put forth. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your support on the 24th of October. Thank you. Thank you, Robert John. Before we go on to the questions, I'd be remiss if I did not invite up Mayor John Creelman and Deputy Mayor Fred Nix, who's been acting as a greeter and cedar back there. And Maybe they'll want to say a few words to address the crowd. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug, and uh, welcome, everyone. I'd like to um, uh, thank the uh, uh, DBOT for organizing this uh, all candidates debate and uh, express our appreciation to uh, our candidates who have. Uh, decided to put their, their name out there for uh, for council and of course uh, give everyone here a warm welcome. Um, I'm gratified by the turnout. Thank you very much and I'll be around at the end of the meeting if anyone has any questions. Thanks John. My name is Fred. I'm the Deputy Mayor of Town of Mono. I've been on council for 12 years. I've been the Deputy Mayor for the last year. 
And although I didn't quite plan on it, um, apparently I'm going to be the deputy mayor for the next four years, <laughs> as I was explaining. I, I listened to the speeches of candidates. I think we're really fortunate to have such a wealth of experience and, and talented people up there. I just a couple, a couple of words of warning. There's things on council like I really enjoy. I enjoy the recreational things. I enjoy the environmental things that we get into. In fact, Karen Morris and I are the co-founders of the Headwater Streams Committee. We've just done a lot of small but value, valuable work in town of um, I'm also quite, as, as Ralph had said, I mean, to, to fiscal things and to put it in perspective, our residential tax rate in Moro is 0.37%, which is less than half of what Orangeville's residential tax rate is. However, there are some things I don't enjoy, but they have to be done if you're going to be a counselor. Noise bylaws, fill bylaws, property standard bylaws. Your eyes will be going around and around your head by the time you get through all that. The thing that's made my job enjoyable and the reason I Red again, like my wife is sitting here, is because all the counselors I've known in Moore have been great people to work with. And that's more than can be said to some of our neighboring municipalities. They're, they're a great bunch of people. But the, the icing on the cake has been the tremendous staff we have in We have some of them sitting here. They are really great to work with. And that's the only reason, well, that and the counselors I work with that I ran again, much against the advice of my wife. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. John. Brad, if we don't get any questions, can you come up and give us a few more minutes? That was very entertaining. <laughs> Are there any questions from the floor? Don't be shy. Step up to the microphone there. We're happy to hear them. Can everyone hear that? No, I can't. Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat it maybe a little bit of a. Oh, hang on, we have a mic. There we go, even better. You know, I was just saying um, uh, if, if, um, I said it so eloquently before. <laughs> uh, if I'm looking to hire one of you or four of you, is that right? Three of you, three of you to to basically work for me as counselor here in Mono. I'm just wondering how many hours a week you're able to work for me. Okay, so speaking order, we'll start again with Frank and each candidate will have up to two minutes to answer. So Frank, over to you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, as I was finishing up my dinner prior to coming here, I asked myself that same question. And like Fred, my wife was there giving me the look. Are you sure you want to do this? And it had a lot to do with the preparation just to be uh, ready to come tonight, the previous all candidates meeting, and the, and the next one coming. So to answer your question directly, I will do whatever it takes. I, I am used to highly technical and very detailed types of reports. I can drill down. I did an audit that saved my previous airline company over a million dollars in training because of the number of errors I could, I could find. So I'm willing to put in whatever it takes. Uh, I would estimate uh, at least uh, 10 hours a week um, because some reports require uh, a little bit at a time and others require uh, full hands-on deck. But I'm a great collaborator. So I'm quite good with networking with whoever, whenever, following the chain of command to come to uh, a resolution. Um, also, I may have to meet with you to have coffee, or you may want to come to my place and pick carrots out of my garden. This communication can be found in many different ways, not just uh, by email, text, or otherwise. To answer your question directly, I would say at least 10 hours a week, if not more. Thank you, Frank. Mark, it's your turn to answer the question. Okay, hey, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. My understanding is that it is going to be at least, and I'll use the term at least, um, one day before the meeting, I imagine there's going to be a long agenda and all the information that has to be dealt with. There's going to be the day of the council meeting, and there's going to be 
a couple of days in between, I'm sure, hearing from residents, hearing their concerns, and I'm sure there's going to be another couple of days, and I know everybody likes to meet on uh, Deputy Mayor Nix. Um, I've learned from him that it's very important to often come and see with your own eyes what uh, residents' concerns are, because that really makes a difference. A, a lot can be done over the internet, over the telephone, but sometimes just a face-to-face -face meeting and actually observing residents' concerns really will shed a lot of light on what the residents are feeling and um, what can be done to mitigate the problem that they're experiencing and correct the situation. I think conversation and uh, understanding can often lead with a good group of people to a win-win solution. I hope that answers it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Doug, over to you. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, one of the things I did before I uh, signed up for this, because my wife wagged her finger at me to say, you better be sure you know what you're going to possibly be signing up for. So um, earlier this summer, before I uh, had the nomination papers out, I spent some time going through the agenda for the last uh, four or five months of, uh, of Mona Council. And I have to say, I was impressed with the amount of work that is involved in just simply going through the documents for each agenda. And it, it kind of, it, it changed my thinking about how much time it would, I would have to invest. The bottom line for me was I came up with, it'll probably be one and a half to two days a week. Um, for me, I can do that since I'm, I'm retired now and have the time, but, but that's what at least I would take, but I'm a slow learner. Thank you, Doug. We're out of your turn. Thank you for that question. <clears throat> so obviously uh, my commitment to my community is a lifelong commitment. And uh, as far as timeline on a, on a regular basis, I have to go back to, um, I prefer to have people judge me based upon my actions, not on my words. And so a good example for you uh, to illustrate my commitment uh, to this community will be that the, the commitment that I had since past uh, to, to, to make myself available for this commitment. So uh, some of you may see me as a, a successful uh, business person who employs five people and wonder how do I have the time to commit to this community? Well, the, the clear answer is that I don't have a life. <laughs> but uh, what I mean by that is my social life is, uh, is the life that, and, the, and the relationships that I build with people within the communities that I choose to belong to. And so when I worked at, uh, as a volunteer, uh, with the Ontario Real Estate Association, I'd be expected to go to about 30 days a year away from my family uh, to different venues, conferences, and so on. I'd also be expected to read anywhere from 60 to 100 pages per meeting and also retreats of two to three days uh, for any individual meeting. And we would meet at least once a month in addition to two or three committees that I chaired. So I was involved in running a corporation or a nonprofit organization, pardon me, uh, that involved 80,000 members, and I was able to do that as well as balancing my career at the same time as building it. In addition to that, you can judge my, uh, my actions over my words by seeing how many hours I'm committed to talking to communicate with my constituents, as well as uh, my community involvement, whether it be philanthropy, raising funds for the food bank, giving out 1,500 gingerbread houses in November or December, sorry. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I do, and you definitely have my commitment that I will do the best job for this community that I possibly can. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Melinda, over to you. Thank you. Well, I've been to 22 council meetings now, and I know that the, pay, the materials that come ahead of time are either the first one that I went to was 600 pages. So that actually took me more than a day to read. Um, and uh, they, they range around the two to three um, 100 pages usually. So um, it, it's a it, it's a part time full time job, and um, I uh, I'm available and I spend the amount of hours that are that are needed. I'm at a lucky spot in life where um, I don't have a wife telling me what I can and cannot do. <laughs> and, uh, and again, I'm really really enjoying it, but it, it it's very variable, right? Some of our meetings are four hours, some of them are two. Like I say, the pages beforehand to read. The emails that go around, the communication with um, residents, 
being the new guy on the block and everybody else being really plugged in with the residents, I wouldn't get um, emails at the beginning. And I remember calling Fred Nix and calling John and saying, no, like, why is nobody contacting me? You know, what, how, am, how am I doing? Um, but now that I've been um, to those 22 meetings and, and made some um, uh, contributions, I'm getting some emails myself. I <laughs> So it's, it's variable, but I will uh, give you what you need. Thank you, Melinda. Shona, over to you. Thank you. And I just want to thank Melinda for taking my joke about not having a wife to check in with. So you took that for me. Uh, when it comes to this position, one of the questions that a lot of residents have asked me is, how are you going to do this? You have six children, you work, uh, you have recreation on the go, and I'm a great multitasker. And if there is something that I need help with, I will communicate that with whomever it is that I'm working with, first and foremost. I also have a daily to-do list. So if that means I need to check in with emails, check in with clients, customers, students, then that's what I do on a daily basis. So this position would be a daily uh, occurrence of checking in with emails, phone calls, and doing the readings. And as an educator or an English teacher, I do a lot of reading. I like to read. I will read in the car before bed, uh, in the kitchen while I'm cooking. So having to do the reading, having to check in with folks on a daily basis, whatever is needed is what I'm ready to do. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Elaine, over to you. Well, thanks for the question. So working for you and 7,500 plus other people, I would have to divide my time very carefully. But I was able to do that as a mom with my children, and so I'm sure I can do it again. Um, my children are at university, so I no longer have to drive them to cadets and riding and after school activities, so I have all that time available and I'm not on the road. Uh, also, as a past counselor, I know what is involved and I know the effort it takes and the hours that it takes to invest. I showed up prepared for every meeting in my term of counsel. And people, there's a saying, if you want something done, ask a busy person. I am a busy person, and a lot of people don't know where I get my energy, but I thrive on all of this stuff. And I tell people in my term of counsel, I learned a lot of things I never knew I wanted to know, and I loved every minute of it. So I will dedicate all the hours that it requires, and I would have to say it's more about quality than quantity. So that's my answer. I've got all the hours to get here. Thank you, Elaine. Ralph, it's your turn. Uh, about eight years ago, I asked a retired uh, uh, counselor how much time to take, and he said five hours per, per week. And um, I got back to him a few months later and I said, Mr. X, how do you said five hours? And he says, I said, at least five hours. At least five hours. And I missed that part. Um, it dropped actually in my experience the last eight years, and maybe I'm a slow learner too, but it takes 10 to, 10 to 20 hours on average. And then you get a bump, and some major thing comes along. And, and no kidding, I'll spend 35 or 40 hours a week on it, and it consumes me. Um, that's a little hard on your private life. It's a little hard on your hobbies and all your other things. You'll also do other things besides counsel. I sit on the Nautilus side of the Valley Conservation Authority, and we have a monthly meeting, and we have minutes and agenda there. I have to assimilate that once a month. I also sit on the Welling Doctrine Well Board of Health, and that's a very uh, structured uh, uh, agenda as well. And that's almost every month and also on fire board. So we get these bumps for various reasons. So if you're planning to set aside 15 hours a week, it's not going to work. It'll work for many weeks, but for lots of times you just have to drop everything. Then you get a phone call at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning from a resident who has a problem. You can't put it off until Monday, you have to do it. And um, so it, it's a good question, Jeff, but I kind of appreciate it. Thank you, Ralph. Robert John, over to you. Um, hearing, um, hearing what everybody said, the engineering in me says that maybe I just take an average of everybody. Um, <laughs> however, um, I think that being a counselor, um, could be 24-7. Um, people's or residents' concerns come any time of the day, any day of the week. 
and I'm certainly prepared to uh, listen to anybody at any time and to deal with them. Uh, there's certain things that you have to do, and that's council meetings, reading uh, agendas and reports and so forth. But I think it's the hands-on uh, time that uh, is very important, and, and uh, you, you can't really put a, a, an hour to it, but uh, I'm quite prepared to, to do that. And uh, as I say, it could be a 24-7 job. Thank you. Thank you for your response. The next question uh, will be directed at Mark Barabin first, and then we'll continue on with the order. Question from the floor. Probably more than half of the people in Mono live in the areas of Starview, Watermark, Cardinal Woods, and Brookfield. What are your plans to be able to connect to this majority of people who seem to be somewhat un unrepresented in the political scene? Mark? Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I sort of have to turn it back on to you people. You're the voters. I live in a mixed uh, rural and subdivision area. So it, uh, I feel that I do have a good understanding of the rural side of it to represent the farmers and the rural and the large uh, acreages. And I live in a subdivision. So I am um, concerned and able to understand the concerns of the subdivision people. So just to put it in a nutshell, I'm your guy and I know how to do Thank you, Mark. Doug, over to you. I think it's a, a great question. Uh, perhaps uh, the question could be rephrased, maybe. Should Mono entertain a ward system uh, for, for councillors uh, in, the, in the area? I happen to think that it, it's worthy of some serious thought because it's impossible for me, living on the 30th side road, to have an intimate um, knowledge of all of the issues going on in the urban part of the uh, of the right again i have a pretty good sense of what's going on in the, in the rural part but uh, admittedly not in the urban side and, and i think the the time perhaps has come that uh, that mona looks at a ward system so that you have a counselor that is specifically dedicated to uh, um, the urban geography of the town and uh, some on the uh, the uh, rural side as well. Thank you, Doug. Brad, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so <clears throat> Miss Purple Hill in there. Uh, so I live in Purple Hill myself. I call it Purple Hill. Well, we don't. Oh. <laughs> so um, listen, I'm just I'm just pulling your leg. <laughs> Um, so listen, I, I, I definitely understand, and, and actually, I, I'll, I'll mirror his opinion that award system is definitely not something that should be thrown off the side. Something that should seriously be considered, simply because the lifestyles, the demographics, uh, the population, all of these things need to be factored in when it comes to representation in our community. And I, uh, I will also agree that, <clears throat> in large part, my decision to run was because I felt like the representation hasn't been there in the past. And so, you know, I'm here now though. Uh, anyways, uh, my point is, is that um, no one wants to be thinking that one person is representing only one segment of the greater population. It would be unfair to everyone in this room to suggest that my interest is only one of the rules. So it's important to understand that anyone at these tables need to properly be able to put themselves in the shoes of everyone who lives within our community. And that is something I'm committed to doing with everyone here, which is also why it's imperative that everyone at these tables get out and speak to the community, not just one element of the community, but everyone within the community. Because how can we purport to be representatives of the community without listening to every single person possible prior to the election? So I encourage all of my fellow candidates to get out there and communicate with people. That is the best way we can hope to understand your concerns, questions, and, and, uh, and, and ideas for the future. So I look forward to uh, meeting all of you when I can, and certainly I look forward to representing everyone within our community as well. Thank you, Brad. Melinda, over to you. 
Thank you. Thanks for that question because it's been hot on my mind coming along to council where we were in Hollywood squares and nobody was talking to anybody in person and so on. Um, last year when we had a Halloween um, decorating contest and I got to drive around at night and I drove 80 kilometers that night looking at all the houses that had been submitted into the into the contest and wow you guys have the awesome place that you live that I didn't know until I was able to do that. And so now that COVID is, is receding, um, going door to door, which I have been in the, in the subdivisions. Again, each, each of your subdivisions is completely different and, and wonderful. Um, so I think it's a two-way street. I think that the residents need to approach council, council needs to approach the residents, and it needs to not just be during election time that there's door knocking and communication. It needs to happen um, all of the time. But I think um, to have five of us on council who are representing all 9,500 of us is better for us as a whole, if we are, um, because it, it's what makes Mono so special to have our rural and our urban, our north and our south, our old and our new young guys, right? So um, I think it's uh, it's a moving forward engage all of us to engage with each other. And I, I certainly promise to do that going forward. Thank you, Melinda. Shona, over to you. Thank you. And as I mentioned in my introduction, part of the reason why I was running for council was because of that lack of representation. Uh, I feel that there's the opportunity here to have a little bit of everything, a little bit of rural, urban, uh, younger, older, may you have it. Um, but when it comes to the subdivisions and having someone represent, again, it could be any of us, as long as we're open and available to the issues that the subdivisions are having as well. Again, I live in the Camilla subdivision. Speaking with my neighbors, we have very differing issues or concerns than those that live um, just across the road here or those who live in Purple Hill. We have different concerns and issues with road maintenance, uh, the highways that we have to drive on, uh, some of our issues with real estate. Uh, the neighborhoods are now changing, so we have rental units being put into some of the homes that we have. We have neighbors that are coming in from the city that doesn't, they don't understand our bylaws, and the bylaws need to be updated as well. So even by going out, knocking on doors, and speaking with can uh, residents, I'm sorry, from the different subdivisions, I'm learning that we're more diverse maybe than we think. We share a lot of the same values here in Mono. We love Mono for a lot of the similar reasons, but whether it be rural or urban, we're very diverse in all of these little pockets and areas as well. Uh, so moving forward, I would promise to continue speaking with different residents from these different pockets to learn about what they're worried about or what their concerns may be. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Elaine, over to you. Well, I uh, right now in the work that I do is all about um, connecting with people and having community engagement top on my agenda. Um, we do need to connect with citizens. We need to make more opportunities for us to get together and have conversation so that we can actually listen to one another and find out what are the specifics, the uniquenesses, and the issues that people are facing and the things that they want to see happen in their own neighborhoods because they are diverse and they are special in their own way. So I think we need to open up the means in which we connect with people. We've got great newsletters going out right now. We've got some good surveys happening right now, but there needs to be some face-to-face -face two way dialogue like this. So maybe we should have an election every month and we can all get together. And then we can have but seriously, we can have more town halls. We can have more, everybody talking to people all the time instead of just once every four years. And also, we could make the county for the um, committee. <laughs> some meetings a little more exciting, but we can talk about that. We can talk about that. I think there's opportunities to listen to what people really want and make sure that we act on that. So I'm open and I'm looking forward to connecting with people in a different way to make our town work for all of us. Thank you, Elaine. If we did this monthly, there'd be a large increase in my fee. <laughs> well, over to you. Um, I had a speech prepared, but I forgot what it was. 
Well, that's, thank you for that question. I think the question is, uh, can I, Ralph Maxwell, who lives on a farm on the seventh line, represent Ross Farrelly who lives in Starby? And can I put myself in your shoes? And the answer is yes, I think you know that. And I think the question really depends on you picking the right people. Um, I've watched um, uh, our members of our council, I three of them went to one of those within two days of, and it was in on Blue Heron Drive. The person was concerned with something, and suddenly they had three counselors there um, trying to deal with it. So it was really good representation. In fact, if we had a ward system, you'd have one counselor, and that, that person wasn't effective. You're on the other one. But I wouldn't want to bring up the ward system debate. We did that at the last, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, all candidates meeting. So I think the issue really is the pick people who can put themselves in, in, in your shoes and you'll be fine. Personally, I lived in Toronto in three different areas for most of my life, and now I live in a rural area in uh, Uno, and I have no difficulty of understanding how people live in both of these areas. Thank you, Ralph. Robert John, over to you. Thank you. Um, I tend to agree with what some of the other candidates have said that there is a a whole host of of issues that uh, can separate the rural from the from the urban. Uh, but I do think that it's important that we communicate that we understand what the issues are, and uh, hopefully we can have more open house discussions to bring people together to uh, to connect each other better. So. Uh, uh, I think the key is is communication. Thank you. Thank you, Robert John. Frank, you'll have the last chance to answer this question. Well, it's a great question. Thank you for that. And and this crowd is uh, I think this crowd is paying attention because this question and the feeling that we need to be connected goes to the very heart. We are mono. And by that, I mean, we don't need to uh, say, well, I live on a farm or I am a farmer or I live in a box or I live on an estate. We live in Mono and Mono is a feeling. As an airline uh, pilot for over 41 years, I have pretty well lived in more hotels than you can imagine. So I have seen and lived and experienced the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm not just talking about the food. And when we come back to this place, this is our home. It's a feeling. It's an impressive feeling. So as a counselor, as echoed by many of these very talented people sitting here, we are here for you. We need to hear from you. We will come. We will have coffee with you. We will walk with you. We will sit with you. We will listen. I've spent 29 years as a peer assistant helping pilots in the airline world. And listening is a skill. I have that skill. I'm willing to use it. And I'm here for you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Are there more questions from the floor? Don't be shy. One step up to the mic. Okay, well, I think the person on Zoom will be here. Go ahead. Hi, so I'm one of the new residents of Mono. I moved here about a year ago. Um, and I hear lots of conversation about. Uh, keeping the small town feel, but at the same time wanting to grow businesses, making sure our budgets are, are intact, which means we're gonna to have to have more money coming in. And I'm wondering, um, the reality is that the diversity of Mono is changing, is going to change and continue to change over the years. But when I look at the councillors that are running, that diversity isn't represented yet. And so I'm wondering what as councillors you're going to be doing to ensure that newcomers that come to the town of Mono feel welcomed and represented. Because even as a white, straight person, when I've come to Mono, I see lots of posts on social media about keeping the city folks out and they want to stay the same, they don't want to change. 
But the reality is that is not the future of mono. So I just want to know what you're doing to make sure that you're prepared for that diversity that is going to happen. Thank you for your question. Dr. Thompson, you'll have the first chance to answer. I would say the first thing is to stay off of Facebook. That's, that's what I'm doing. It can, uh, it can get pretty ugly. I think that the, the answer, I'm an old white guy uh, sitting up here, but I'm not alone. Um, the issue, and then we talked a little bit about it with regard to the last question, is about listening to people and, and communicating with people. And I happen to think that the town alone does a reasonable job in communicating with residents uh, you know, via their website, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I saw a recent uh, survey on fireworks, uh, that's I thought, quite an excellent response. So I think people are listening, but um, it's going to take some work and it. It can't be, uh, it can't be left uh, hanging. It's got to require effort and an investment of, of time. And I would be willing to, to make that investment. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Brad, over to you. Thank you very much for that question. I, uh, I believe it's extremely important that we uh, continue to foster an inclusive community uh, in Mono. Um, I feel that uh, I, as much as some probably don't know, I'm actually half Trinidadian, believe it or not. Uh, my mom, who raised me, uh, came from Trinidad, and uh, my wife is uh, Trinidadian as well, uh, as well as German. And my mother-in-law, who lives with us, uh, she's Muslim, uh, my wife's Catholic, I'm Baptist, so uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting dinner conversation sometimes, but um, I'm also a realtor, and that means I deal with people from all walks of life, from all different locations. I understand what it is to have to find a way to fit in a community that may not reflect who you are. And how important it is that we continue to foster an inclusive environment, because guess what? That diversity could be our strength. Um, and I really think that it's an opportunity for us as a community to see growth in all of the right ways, because guess what? Sometimes that diversity are also the biggest advocates for the things we hold dear. A good example, the environment and a lot of other elements that are extremely important and rooted in our community could be brought forward and, uh, and, and we could thrive in a lot of different ways without having to grow the population exponentially as some may fear. Um, diversity should be our strength and that's, and that's definitely something I've always believed in and I look forward to seeing how Mono grows in the near future and in the distant future. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Melinda, over to you. Thank you. That's a very interesting question. So the council um, and I, um, Champion Five um, Rock this year started a diversity um, committee and have there is a diversity um, questionnaire that's out now that is closing in uh, just in the next week or whatever. So then we should uh, all answer that uh, survey and put down our thoughts because we're in the information gathering stage right now because you are absolutely right our population is not necessarily going to grow um soon but it is changing you're right as people as people pass and move on um, new families come come in and so the, the more events and so on that we can have the social um you know the old-fashioned um welcome wagon if it's our uh, recreation um, we've got um, the Halloween party coming up we've got the, all the new families coming thank up. you Melinda Shona over to you thank you so equity diversion and or diversity I'm sorry and inclusion is something that I work with every day in education uh, majority of my students at Humber College where I work are international students uh, they are new to Canada, and we're, just, we're seeing a lot of that in our community as well. And this diversity goes beyond where someone comes from. Uh, as some of the other counselors have mentioned, it, it's also in their beliefs and how they live their lives daily. 
And it comes down to educating and continuing to have open communication and educating uh, all residents on who our neighbors are and what their backgrounds may be and what those expectations in the community may be coming and going uh, so that we can make adjustments to all live together. Uh, my partner, for example, is Haitian and Turkish. And so I've been told many times that my children are biracial. And I don't need to put labels on everything. I just know that my children are part of a community and the education of accepting who people are not based on their skin color or where they come from should not be important in the community, but educating each other on how we can uh, cohabitate, work together and, and grow together is, is very important. So when it comes to difficult questions, uh, or new or different things. That's when we should be listening, uh, listening to others, letting others celebrate or explain uh, some of their successors or their backgrounds so that we can celebrate those as well. Uh, my time is up, so thank you. Thank you, Shona. Elaine, over to you. Well, first of all, welcome to Mono. <laughs> um, I came to Mono waiting for the welcome wagon. I didn't know you had to call them to come to your house. So, they never came. so, so we created our own welcome to the neighborhood and had a big party, which we've had every year since then. So um, as has been mentioned, there is a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee for the town now. And I think that is a great first step. Uh, out of that committee, we'll create uh, some guidance for how council can conduct themselves, for what they need to do with committees and on council, and how they need to connect with the community. I think also out of that will create a sense of belonging and the more people who get connected to the town and connected to committees um, and connected in a way of feeling that they belong, the more representation we will have, the more representation of newcomers, new citizens, the new uh, arrivals, whether they come from Toronto or whether they come from anywhere else, they will feel comfortable and they will feel represented when more of them come out and meet with other people. So welcome, and I too came from Toronto. I'm a cityite before I got here to be a monoite. Thank you, Elaine. Ralph, it's your turn. Uh, I worked in healthcare in downtown Toronto, and whites were um, the minority. Uh, and I never really, really thought about it. Um, there's uh, uh, so many different ethnic uh, backgrounds in Toronto, and they just, they work together well or they don't, and it's not related to their race. Um, that's a, I think that's a very important thing to understand. Um, in, in December of last year, I proposed a motion to council that we look at the possibility <laughs> that we can improve the situation for people who feel discrimination, whether it's on the basis of race, age, uh, sexual um, orientation, uh, or any other factor. And that was approved, and um, we now have a committee. Um, and on the committee are a fairly diverse group of people. And their their goal is to try to understand what's happening in 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 in, in Mono with respect to discrimination, and to try and make some improvements on it. I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Robert John, over you. Yes, uh, I I support diversity. Uh, diversity adds a, a better understanding of individual differences, uh, allows for different opinions, culture and knowledge and, and different perspectives on a number of things. So I, I totally support it. And I think that there are a number of social gatherings that happen in Mono. And uh, I think we should encourage everyone to participate in those. And I would look for new ones to to uh, um, increase uh, uh, increase uh, getting involved in diversity. Thank you. John, Frank, over to you. Uh, thank you for that important question. If anybody wants to fill out the survey, if they haven't seen it, you go onto the Town of Mono website, go to the search bar, and just type in diversity survey, and it will pop up. It closes on October the 10th, pretty close to Thanksgiving. 
I think it's a very important issue, and I applaud the uh, town of Mono and the participants for having this committee. Um, being in the airline business as long as I have, and I'm now retired two years, uh, it was like working for the United Nations. Um, like uh, Ralph mentioned, uh, you know, you, you might be out of a crew of 14, there might be three white people. It don't matter, crew is crew. People are people, and uh, we can get along, we can connect with each other, and we can take care of each other. So I support this uh, survey and moving forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Mark, it's your turn. Great, thank you. And that's a great question. Um, I just want to echo all my Frank's comments about the uh, Welcome to Newcomers website and the diversity committee and uh, the questionnaire. Diversity is really a great strength. Inclusiveness is a great strength. These are problems that we have to deal with. And I was so fortunate um, a couple of weeks ago, riding my bike, like I always do, down first line, I was invited to a very large Sikh wedding. And so I really got to um, experience diversity from the other side because I was the only uh, non seat there, so uh, I was sort of like white boy Mark the whole time, and I felt very included. There was no problem whatsoever, and, and I think it's really a state of mind, and I think that's a state of mind that we have here in Mora, that we're all included, we're all the same. There was no lines drawn at, when I was there, so I was so pleased to see that, um, that, that their attitude towards me was the same as my attitudes towards them. There was no barrier, there was no difference. We were all just people there for the wedding. And it was just so neat to see all the different uh, customs and just all the way that the people who weren't even as comfortable in English would still come and talk just to make sure that I felt welcome. So this is what we are in Mono. We are a great group of people. And I think we, we don't have the barriers as long as we don't have the barriers in our mind. We are going to just get along great with everybody, and that's the way it should be. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there was a gentleman at the back and another question. I'm not sure if this is a question, but I think it's a little unfair to ask somebody to vote for three of these highly qualified people. <laughs> and I just like to make a motion. And the increase in number of Mono councillors tonight. <laughs> and I have a Some of us fiscal box in the crowd might not agree a fine six more councillors. <laughs> Another question in the back. I agree with two community centers in one. This one and one and one. They're completely underutilized. In the past 10 years, they've lost nearly two million dollars. I've spoken to councils, the last three councils occasionally about this, but nothing concrete has been done about this. If elected, are you quite happy with the status quo, or do you have some way of improving this? Bradley Mayor Harmon, you have the first crack at this question. I'm never happy with the status quo. Um, there's definitely a question of underutilization, and, and I think that, uh, Again, I think a lot of our problems in Mono as it relates to uh, participation uh, can be improved with better engagement and inclusion. So uh, a good example would be a lot of people in South Mono, specifically the subdivisions, do not feel like they're a part of Mono in the same sense that a lot of rural Mono residents do. That's uh, an opportunity Okay, so that means that why are they going to Orangeville to get those facilities and use these services when they should be coming here? So I, I do think there's opportunities to leverage the communities that we have by engaging with them in a more intimate way. Um, I think uh, that's uh, that's something that I would definitely be able to uh, leverage and uh, and try to encourage uh, multiple 
demographics to start to participate in mono politics, but more importantly in mono services, and just educating the community about the services that they can have access to. Um, because to be frank with you, as someone who helps a lot of people move into this community, they have a very low understanding of what types of services uh, are available to them. And I think that as a town, we should definitely be doing more uh, to educate our new residents as well as our existing residents about uh, what it is that Mono has to offer, which is in fact a lot. So uh, I look forward to uh, addressing uh, uh, underutilized uh, resources that the town has. And I definitely think that, you know, there's always the conversation about financial prudence, uh, whether or not, uh, but I don't think that these two facilities that you mentioned are something that we should um, reconsider. I think that they just need to be uh, an item that's educated to communities that are yet reached out to effectively. Thank, Thank you, Brad. Melinda Davy, it's your turn. Thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, I'm hoping that you're noticing that it's been spruced up in here since before COVID. And also the um, uh, Mono Center Community um, Hall has also had some um, improvements. And I think with those improvements, the idea would, will be that there will be more rentals and there will be more events held here. Um, but you're right, it's a kind of a loss leader, um, but it's a, a uh, gem for us that I would hate to see us um, lose because we were not able um, to come up with new ideas. So I would think that moving forward, there there will we will see more rentals happening. The, this this facility, of course, is used with the um, ski club, which isn't going anywhere either. So uh, it's it's a difficult um, thing when there's been a loss of money, but I, I don't think that there's a uh, necessarily to assume that it will be that it will continue. I think it's extremely important for our community to have these facilities. Thank you, Melinda. Shona Robbins, it's your turn to answer this question. So when I think about the two buildings, I think about parks, recreation, I start to get a little bit more excited because I do like to plan, I like to organize. And when I think about uh, recreation or the recreational department, first off, I would like to see more put into that department so we don't have one or two people trying to do everything. With these buildings, we have some nice lights, so obviously we want to be mindful of some of the programs that we come in with. But why can't we start to partner with some of our small or medium businesses uh, and try to offer more programs? For example, could we not have a cooking class or a birthday party come in downstairs with a local artist come in and try to use the space and have people coming in. At that point, we can educate them on some of the other programs that we have, uh, rather than just sending out the flyers, actually interacting with folks. So when I think about the ability and the space that we have in both buildings, uh, we have indoors and we have outdoors. So there's quite a bit of acreage around both facilities. Uh, and thinking about doing some gardening programs outside. Can we grow our pumpkins for our Halloween uh, in the backyard? Can we expand things like snowshoeing? I know that's been on uh, the topic as well, but trying to partner up with some of the local business owners as well, and utilize the buildings so that there are people in here, and then we can communicate more about their wants and needs or concerns on a regular basis. Uh, while also utilizing the facility and also partnering with our business owners. Thank you, Shona. Elaine Cates, it's your turn to address this question. Uh, the community center issue has been on the agenda for quite a while. It's been sensitive for a long time. So we do need to focus some attention on these valuable assets because they really are. Um, making it a priority to get some feedback from the community about what they would like to see in the community centers and what they would like to do in them. Find out how they would like to see them utilized. Um, there, there's all kinds of opportunities. We were talking about citizen engagement and opportunity to connect with one another. We could have community dinners. We've got full kitchens in both of these facilities, more than two kitchens. So there, there is opportunity to look at that. So. We need to look at event planning in a different way, perhaps. Um, also, I really believe that we need to find out from the community how they want to use the community centers that are there for them. 
find out what they want to do in them. So that means talking to people. That means sitting down and having conversations about what we can do. There are great spaces that show us that. And so we've got great opportunity to um, really utilize these <coughs> assets. Thank you, Elaine. Ralph Mangelo, it's your turn. Uh, I'm a fairly fiscally oriented person, but I think that um, that, that should not drive things in, with respect to these two buildings. These two buildings are used for many, many different activities that support the life of people living in Rome, and that's the critical thing. Uh, the building to the north is in the center of the Pittsburgh Road, well, being in the center of Rome. This building is in the south, where our increasing population is. And it's also, as you probably know, it's the home of the one of the biggest ski clubs in, in, in Southern Ontario. So I uh, appreciate your question, Bill. Um, and many people have been asking this uh, for, for the last other years. How can we make them um, break even? Um, I'd be nice to make, bring more money in, uh, but I don't think they need to break even. They're service buildings that are provided for the benefit of all people. Uh, it's a bit fair putting $2 million behind it because a fair bit of that is money that was not gained because of COVID when they haven't been able to use the building. Thank you, Ralph. I understand Robert John Lackham didn't hear the question, so I'm paraphrasing here. But the town of Mona has two community centers that reportedly lose $2 million a year. Do you plan to address this? Uh, <laughs> Certainly, I'd look at that. Uh, I'm a fiscally responsible individual as well. However, I, I think a, a, a comment was made about COVID, which is uh, uh, quite true, and perhaps they haven't been utilized to their fullest over the last couple of years. So uh, I think we have to communicate to the public that uh, and the residents that we have these facilities and we need to understand exactly how they would like to use them. And uh, um, increase the programming. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, again, a, a communication uh, answer and, and hopefully we can uh, draw from the public what they would like to use those facilities for. Thank you. Thank you, Robert John. Frank Flood, it's your turn to answer this question. Yes, um, obviously COVID uh, has affected the entire world and we weren't left out of that at all. And moving forward, we do have uh, fair number of financial pressures, which, uh, as Brad mentioned, may be an opportunity, actually. That opportunity is if we advertise respectfully various mediums, just like people coming to Mono Place Provincial Park and taking over the roads and the parking and the park, et cetera, et cetera. That was all done through social media and word of mouth once they got here we could uh, launch an effective campaign. As a counselor, I'd be happy to be a part of that. One of the things you need when people come is they need a place to put their head and a place to drink, perhaps, a place to eat and entertainment. So the new hotel here may even launch other hotels in the future, will encourage and uh, support these two facilities. So. Um, we do need business income because we're not going to get a lot of income from residents. We need to encourage business. So I'd be fully supportive of a marketing campaign respectfully done um, to encourage and encourage staff to be very vigorous in their approach. Thank you, Frank. Mark Darby, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, the short answer is that I am not comfortable with large financial losses, uh, but I don't have the answer right now. But I think it would be possible to get an answer if we were to lean on staff, maybe um, get counsel, good communication, maybe even some outside professional ideas, put all of these people together because we've got a very intelligent group there, and perhaps they could come up with some way to possibly increase the revenues. Um, I, I agree with Ralph. These um, facilities, in my opinion, don't have to be money makers. They are great, valuable resources to our community. And um, with COVID, I think maybe 
you know, as everybody else has mentioned, it has taken a little bit of a downturn, taken a bit of edge off the revenue coming in. But I definitely don't want to lose these facilities. They don't have to make money, but it would be nice to increase the revenues by getting some great minds together. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Doug Thompson, you'll have the last chance to answer this question. Well, I don't really have anything new to add. I'll, I'll join the chorus here, and you've all heard from everyone. They uh, they don't want to uh, burn these places down, uh, but rather keep them. Um, have some smart marketing, um, improve their their financial uh, status, um, and I think it also requires leadership from your elected representatives as well. Um, it's great to ask the residents what they want. But I know if I went up and down uh, my side road and asked people what they would want to do for it, I'd get a lot of shrugs. I'm not sure. Uh, and you know what? Sitting here, I don't know what the answer is. I, I do think of Henry Ford. Um, he once said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. Uh, so I, I really think that there needs to be some leadership from, uh, from people up here that uh, can figure this out. I have every confidence, though, that it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. We have time for one more question from the floor we go on, before we go on to candidate closing remarks. Um, hi. I, um, I've listened to all of you and, and uh, good luck. <laughs> and uh, thank you for those who have given service. Thank you for that uh, years of service, uh, whether it's volunteer, whether being on council. Each of you mentioned environment. And I'd really be interested to know what you feel going forward uh, since there's been the declaration of climate emergency. The environmental concerns are that are related to Mono and uh, ideas on, on solutions, um, including residents as part of those solutions. So what are your concerns and um, what do you see going forward that we need to do as residents and also as council. So Melinda, maybe you'll be up first on this one. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so we had just council just last uh, meeting um, received the um, climate action plan um, for the town of Mono, which <coughs> excuse me, kind of um, mirrors what's going on with the over the Dufferin County, but <clears throat> the idea that we're now into the implementation part of the plan. So exactly what is it that we're going to do? Exactly your question. So um, water conservation is, is top of mind um, and the story of, of our wetlands, which is happening just here in, in Menorah um, and planting seedlings are things that we're going to do going forward, but also to be encouraging um, more people to have electro electric vehicles um, so our town hall has um, installed a uh, this past year, or maybe it was year before COVID has made it time a little weird. But recently we have put a um, a charging station there, and um, so education is the uh, main thing to get out what we have put in our plan to the um, residents going forward. Uh, it's a big big issue and will um, require all of us to start doing small things and then reassessing whether what we're doing is, is, is working, but it is, uh, it's top of mind, absolutely. Thank you, Melinda. Shona Robbins, over to you. I think when it comes to building and applying our environment, we have to also partner or build stronger partnerships with the towns uh, that are surrounding us because a lot of their vehicles, trucks, they're <laughs> coming through our community uh, they're not necessarily from our community or staying in our community. Uh, so I think when we are looking at our action plan, we have to build those stronger partnerships so that if we do run into an issue, we have a stronger voice within the province, within the county, uh, and we can work together so that we're not working against the towns that are around us. Uh, when it comes to the development in Mono, I think we should be remaining as a smaller community. Uh, our water is very important to us, migration, uh, the different effects on our vegetation, our wildlife, it's obviously being affected again by all the growth that's happening around us. Uh, so I think that we should be remaining a small community while also building those partnerships around us so that we can preserve what we have. 
Thank you, Shona. Elaine Cates, over to you. Thank you. Can I have your question again, please? I, I'm interested in, in what you think the, uh, as a climate emergency, what you think the emerging issues are in the next four years that uh, some solutions, but also what you recognize as being needed uh, in Promono uh, in the environment. Okay, thank you. So I have been um, part of the climate adaptation committee for the county and with rising spiking temperatures and different uh, rainfall, and we're talking about not um, weather, we're talking about climate. So I've been involved at the committee for the last year. We just met last week on an implementation plan and that's being done countywide. So there's lots of good things coming for sure. Um, if we talk about the environment and how we protect what we have right now, um, I think we need to really preserve the green space that we have because that's going to help. Cutting down trees and doing things like that, we know that adds to um, challenges with temperature, with erosion and all kinds of things. We have to pay attention to farming practices. There's so many things wrapped up in this, but one of, one of the closest things we can look at is our parks and we need to preserve those and we need to protect them. And there's such thing as loving something to death. So we need to make sure we don't let them get trampled, that they don't get overrun. So we need to manage that better. So I, I think the question is a big one and it's important. The whole climate response is a big one. And I can just say the plan is very good. It's been very involved. And so I know at the county level that will be filtered down to municipalities so that they can include that in their climate plans. Does that help you? Thank you, Elaine. Ralph Mangslow, over to you. Uh, it was about 30 years ago in Rio de Janeiro that we had a, the first climate change uh, international meeting. And um, many, many countries came on board with that and that promises. Uh, since that time, um, our carbon emissions have continued to rise uh, roughly 4% a year. We're in trouble if we don't change. I think we all recognize that this problem, uh, but we don't recognize that it's a big problem or a problem we need to deal with right now. Uh, unless we do, we're going to be in trouble. Um, I just like to read a quote that um, came from uh, Elliot, Elliot, Elliot Harris, and he's the UN chief economist. I mean, this involves the environment as well, uh, Karen, which I think is part of the question. He said, unless we better manage the natural world, we'll destroy the foundations of our life on Earth. That's pretty sober. Uh, Mono has a wonderful natural environment, and I'm committed to uh, preserving this and maintaining it. Uh, and not getting it in the middle of the way by various things, particularly new development. So I think that we in Mono here have, have, a, have a jewel, but our jewels do not continue to shine unless we keep polishing them. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Robert John Lackey, over to you. Thank you. Uh, if, if that's Karen, I recognize your voice. And uh, I know that we have had several discussions on environmental issues and worked on a couple. Um, I, I would say that um, uh, encroachment into natural areas is, is very important. We can't allow creep to occur. Um, streams, you know, that's dear to my heart as well, that I've done a lot of stream work in my, in my day. They're very important to maintain and buffer strips. Uh, farming practices was mentioned, and um, I, I've been involved with some things in that in the past. Um, again, overutilization of areas. Um, we have some very pristine natural green space spaces in the in the town of Mono, and if we exploit them, um, they will be lost. And uh, um, Climate change is, is upon us. I, I've seen it on my own property. Um, I've seen my pond drop in, in groundwater elevation. So it, it is something that is extremely important. And uh, I would certainly do anything in my power to, uh, to help us uh, preserve what we have. Thank you.
Thank you, Robert John. Frank Flood, over to you. It's a great question, and there probably isn't enough time for us to solve it tonight. But what we can do is as we uh, wake up tomorrow and have our coffee or breakfast or whatever we do in the morning, is we can say, what is it I can do today? Who can I talk to in my neighbors, my friends, my family? It's the old uh, think globally, but act locally. In the Town of Mono strategic plan, the priority is environment, economy, equity, in that order. And I have that from my closing statement here because I believe very strongly that that order, if we cannot meet the environment factors for any action, we do not proceed to the next step. We collectively have to do this and we have to do it now as Rob said. Thank you, Frank. Mark Darby, over to you. Thank you, environment. That's a great question because it is so important. It affects all of us. It affects our life and our lifestyle. That's why it was in my opening remarks. I'm gonna just pivot back to that for a second. It is super important. <laughs> And I'm just going to focus on water because I think a lot of the other candidates have touched on the other environmental, the, the trees, the forests, and all that kind of stuff. So when you hear the news and you hear about, oh, major drought in California, millions and millions of people without water, and you, and you look at the picture on TV of those giant hundreds of mile long reservoirs that are down 50 and 60 feet, that is so critical. But that's in California. Oh, wait. Primrose School ran out of water. <laughs> pretty close to home. So I think we have to, and I'm not sure what uh, Council's position is with respect to a water study in Mona, but I think it would be very, very important that we are very confident in that our water resources are still there and they are available to us. So if it's not being done now, I would very strongly support a water study to, sure, to ensure that we do not end up in any kind of water crisis situation. And I have very strong support for our climate action plan. Thank you, Mark. Doug Thompson, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, my friends to my right uh, with regard to, to water resources. It, it happens to be uh, uh, something very near and dear to me. I, I, there's, it's obviously it's a complex problem that's being worked on by some incredibly smart people uh, all over the world. Um, but I think that we can start with some tangible things here. And one of the things that I would support would be an expansion of the green belt in Mono. And I think one of the advantages of doing that, among others, is perhaps another layer of protection for our our vital water resources. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, using the lens of climate action on everything that we do um, from a government stand standpoint in Mono would also, I think, pay dividends. But uh, it's a great question. It's something we're, we're all going to be grappling with um, for, uh, for the years to come. Um, and like I say, to me, in Mono, uh, water issues are at the, uh, at the top of the list. Thank you, Doug. Bradley Mayor Harmon, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> so that, that question is good. <clears throat> the question I, uh, I, I've been asking myself is, how can Mono best serve uh, the environmental uh, preservation movement? And uh, I have a few ideas. And uh, in fact, I also saw the environment, economy, and, and uh, equity component on the website. So that was going to be part of one of the things I wanted to say. Speaking to that, those three lenses are how we make our decisions as to what's in the best interest of Mono and the environment that we so uh, treasure. And so we have a responsibility uh, to preserve and to promote environmentalism because we are so blessed to have a living environment and a community that is uh, treasures and protects these, uh, uh, these assets. And so when you have something so special, it is paramount upon you to ensure that you protect it, but also that you share it. And so I think that there's an opportunity, and I think that the council and, and our community should look at uh, continuing to obviously preserve the environment, but also to encourage ecotourism 
or other elements so that we can invite economies that also treasure the environment and value it like we do. In so doing, we can grow the economy, improve the, uh, the uh, environmental protection, and also uh, facilitate uh, an environment where we can become the hub in Ontario and be an example to the rest of the world and, and the communities that, we, that surround us on how environmentalism can actually be an asset rather than a liability. So I look forward to exploring opportunities that make our community uh, shine brightly, but also set an example for other communities that uh, could uh, take a, book, a, a page out of our book. So I look forward to working for you all. Thank you, Brad. Before we ask each candidate to give their closing statements, I just want to remind them that they have two minutes and it'll be up here on the uh, screen as it's been all night. So continuing with our speaking work, Shona Robbins, uh, we'd like to hear your closing statement, please. Uh, again, thank you for your time and consideration with this within this event. As I introduced earlier, there appears to be some division or some resident concerns needed for review within a few different areas of our town. Some residents feel that communication is an issue in town. And even though I do feel the town of Mono does utilize various channels to reach residents quite well, I do feel that council does not always take into consideration what residents are saying or what they are actually asking for. As council, we should be giving residents a reason to engage, a reason to collaborate. Uh, residents I've spoken to have shared their desire to quit filling out our surveys or attending our, our council meetings because they feel that their comments just go unheard. I realize that it's impossible to make everyone happy 100% of the time. Nevertheless, I do feel that Mono should be better with things like communication, accessibility, and inclusion. Mono has changed and developed over the years. Mono is a great place to live. However, we do need some additional revisions, perhaps with some of the bylaws that were created before some of the subdivisions were in place or before our roads became increasingly busy. Items such as noise bylaws, rental real estate matters are now some of the additional considerations that are needed to uh, match up with the reflections of the changes in town. Mono is made up of various areas, and despite what Mono used to look like, we are now different. We need to not only preserve all those reasons why we love Mono, but we also need to construct a plan that keeps Mono affordable, desirable, and where our residents want to live. So when we are getting ready for the polls in the next few weeks, I do consider, or I hope that you will consider me, Shona Robbins, as a new voice within council. Thank you. Thank you, Shona. Elaine Capes, your closing statement. So I served council, so I know what's involved. People still call me, even though I'm not at that table, to ask me how to navigate what seems to be some kind, sometimes misunderstanding and navigation challenges. I, I want to make sure that I commit to you today for the next four years that I will work wholeheartedly to understand what our residents, citizens want, what you want, and how we can best serve you and best look after our town. I want to listen to what you have to say, and I will work to get things done. It would be my privilege to work for you to keep Mono beautiful, being good stewards of our land, our waterways, <laughs> our parks, being safe, again, in our communities, on our roads, and keeping it affordable. So managing the budget, operational practices, and being innovative in our approaches. I humbly ask for your vote but I really encourage you to vote no matter who you vote for. And thank you for doing that. And I look forward to um, hopefully serving you as a counselor. And <coughs> thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, DBOT, for hosting. Thank you, Elaine. Ralph Mantelow, your closing statement. Uh, this is an impressive group. I think democracy is alive. <laughs> You people that are sitting there have a challenge. Um, how do you decide who to vote for? Um, 
Words are important. Um, probably actions are more important because that would be what the person is all about. And that's why I ask you to look at what I've done in the last two terms. If you um, pick up my card, you'll see what I've done over the last two terms in council. And it lists a number of things there. The biggest thing I've done really is not listed there. It's just the week to week good governance. Good governance involves understanding what the facts are and getting opinions, and then sifting through and coming to a good decision. And I think that's something that uh, has become one of my skills over, over the years. Uh, so um, good luck with your voting. And um, I hope that you recognize that my experience is something that can work for you. Thank you, Ralph. Robert John Black, your closing statement. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this all candidates meeting. Um, I've really enjoyed it. It's been very informative for me. And there were lots of great questions posed by those in attendance. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, it, it bears out the diverse nature of our social, environmental, and economic setting. And it confirms that there is a lot of hard work ahead of us and i've enjoyed it and i look forward to the challenge to serving the residents of mono for the next four years and uh um there are some great candidates at the table it's uh it's an honor to be amongst you so good luck and and thank you very much for for this evening thank you robert john frank flood your closing statement i'll keep it pretty uh Concise here, this is getting on in time. Once again, as per my card, which is on the table and will be distributed throughout Mono, service, integrity, action. My integrity is the thread that drives me into action and I will serve you. I am here for you. I will come to your place. I will meet with you. I will listen. I will do the work. And in answering the previous question to the fellow at the end there, I did say it's a minimum of 10 hours a week because I put in at least 20, if not more, just preparing over the last few months. I reviewed the Code of Conduct bylaw 2019-11. A lot of good stuff in there. It's available on the Mullen website. Every counselor should be fully aware of what's in here. As a previous safety advocate, line pilot and flight technical pilot, I'm very familiar with the, with the policy, procedures and practices. I call that following, following the balancing ball. Anyway, what that means is I can follow an issue, I can digest the issue, I can collaborate, communicate and cooperate with all levels of government as I work from local government all the way up to and including the International Civil Aviation Organization at the highest level. I can do the work. So to finish off, I feel a lot of gratitude, not only living here, but being able to sit here at the table with all these folks. My favorite toast as we approach Thanksgiving weekend is family, friends, and fortune. Please vote for myself and have a great Thanksgiving weekend. Thank you, Frank. We'll now hear closing statements from Mark Garvey. Thank you. As strong leadership and community service with integrity values, and as your counselor, I will bring a collaborative, consensus oriented, win win solutions approach to resolving issues. I will respect protect and preserve our residents' right to safely and peacefully enjoy the property and all the town resources, while prioritizing protection and preservation of our wildlife and our environment, including our very important water resources. I will ensure open lines of communication to your council members through proactive citizen engagement efforts and by council actively encouraging residents' participation and comment. I will encourage bylaw review and enhancement to ensure increased ease of officer contact and enforcement. I strongly support increasing recreation and trail opportunities, climate action plan initiatives, and of course, very strong support 
and appreciation to our farmers and local businesses as they work to provide our community and ensure that our goods and services and our food supply chain are secure. I live on a farm, small farm on First Line, just north of Highway 9 by Brookfield. So I feel that I am very well positioned to understand and uh, project and protect the urban and rural concerns. So I want to thank uh, moderator Doug, Diana, and everyone here for all your work in towards making this meeting and uh, election coming up on election a success. I ask for your support. So everyone, please feel free to pick up one of my eco-friendly flyers. Visit my website, oparkdarby.com. All my contact information is there. And I'd be happy to hear from any questions to have. So together we can keep Thank on you, and lovely and livable the way we want it to be. Doug Thompson, we'll now hear your final remarks. Thank you. Uh, let me end by saying, first of all, thank you for your interest in this election. I think people should care about what council does. As the third tier of government, local government is responsible for ensuring local communities run as smoothly and efficiently as possible, with citizens able to access the services and programs that they need to live safely and in good health. I think local councils have arguably the biggest impact on people's day-to-day -day lives. It's an enormous responsibility to run for public office. You need integrity, effective communication skills, commitment, passion, empathy, decision-making skills, accountability, innovation. This is a laundry list of leadership skills that I've honed as a business leader over the past 40 years. I believe we need business leaders like me who look for possibilities instead of thinking the world is filled with problems. When you think that way, you aren't able to see solutions. This election is about what sort of future you want for your community. I'm asking for your vote so I can represent this amazing town in charting an exciting and prosperous future. My name is the last one on the ballot. Make me your first choice for strong representation. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. We'll now hear closing remarks from Bradley Mayor Herman. Well, what a night. Um, it's been fantastic getting to know my fellow candidates more intimately, and I hope, um, I hope I have more opportunities to work with each and every one of you. I'm certainly humbled by the level of experience, knowledge, passion, and commitment that you have towards your community, and I hope that you can see the same qualities in myself. And I hope that I have the opportunity to show you what uh, type of determination I have to make sure that I give you the best representation possible. Um, one of the things that I, I like most about Moments is the opportunity that it represents uh, and the future, the bright future that we could have ahead of us. And so it is my hope that I can apply the skills, the talent, the motivation, passion, and the education and experience I have from a business perspective, but also as someone who is on one of the younger generations uh, I feel that an opportunity lies ahead of us to harness uh, the communities uh, within Mono, and uh, I hope to be a part of the uh, part of the solution uh, that is uh, in, in encouraging more engagement, but also being on platforms that attract people and uh, and create opportunities for other industries that will support our environment, our economy, and our equity. So I look forward to continuing to push forward and uh, just want to make sure I establish what my platform is, which is uh, financial prudence, uh, the environment, um, maintaining safe streets and community, and um, obviously to be an advocate and a voice uh, and available to everyone here. So you have my commitment if you vote for me that I will support you, I will be available to you, and I will make sure that this uh, community sees the progress and the vision that I hope we all can imagine uh, in the future. So thank you so much for having me and thank you uh, for setting this up, Lift Up Your Board of Trade. Thank you, Brad. Melinda Day, your closing statement, please. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Deaf Board of Trade for hosting this evening's meeting. And I'd also like to thank you, the residents, for um, showing such passion for our town and our fellow candidates for a uh, earnest discussion. 
Um, I can tell from the topics that we've discussed today, which are different than the topics that were brought up at the last meeting, so I'm hopeful that we'll get even different ones at the next one, that there are a lot of concerns. Um, and so a vote for me will ensure that you have a collaborative, open-minded representative on council who has listened to you and your concerns. I will continue to represent you in our council debate and decision-making and strive to balance your wishes with the best interests of the municipality. I will ensure that our taxes remain reasonable, our services remain world-class, and that we maintain those special qualities that make Mono the only place we all want to live, a wonderful balance of urban and rural. Please vote for me on October 14th, or up 14th to the 24th. Don't have to wait till the 24th. <laughs> Thank you, Melinda. We couldn't pull off an event like this without a lot of great help. Um, McKenna and Nicole, thank you for your technical assistance. I don't know how you were able to bring uh, a candidate into our room here and, and let all the, the delegates here hear them, but that was fantastic. Just made things really, really fair. Diana Morris, thanks for putting this all together. Um, I've done a whole lot of these with Diana and I get a lot of credit, but I really don't do very much. I show up a quarter to seven and there's notes here on the table and there's a list of the speaking order and I just talk, so it's great. Thank you, Diana. Thank you all for attending tonight. You have a really tough choice here in, in Mono. I live in a little municipality about 30 minutes west of here. I was one of these uh, last week and we have a ward system and I would vote for any one of these folks ahead of my choices, so congratulations. <laughs> Um, we hope that you've learned more about your local candidates and that you'll get out to vote on October the 24th. Candidate bios and information can be found on our website, www.dufferinbot.ca. Remember to think local, think Dufferin. Thank you. Have a great night.